Bifocal, Chapter 15, Haroon. A special assembly is called the next morning, taking us out of our classes. I've never seen the principal so angry. He rages against the vandals and threatens dire consequences for anyone who even thinks of pulling a similar stunt in the school or even in the community. We file back to class. I hear phrases in the hall like troublemakers, probably did it themselves, and they'll never catch these guys, and surveillance cameras all over the school. I realize I'm surrounded by kids who are not Muslim. I start to feel scared until I spot another Muslim student. I've never felt that at my school before. At home, my parents are trying hard to keep a truce between themselves and my sister. We have guests every evening for a far. Hospitality is part of the tradition, but the guests also act as a buffer. Julian joins us one evening. He talks with Zana the same way he would as if she were wearing her usual blue jeans and sweatshirt. The normalcy of it calms me down. The magic Julian, I tell him. Thanks. He gives me his crazy grin and goes off into the night. I try to get more into the spirit of the holiday by reading one of the books I've had since I was a kid. It's on the life of the prophet. The story is so wonderful and familiar that it calms me too. I begin to think that this Ramadan might turn out all right after all. Then the phone rings. Thinking it's Julian, I pick up the receiver. Hello? An operator speaks. I have a collect call here for Haroon Badwi from Azim. Will you accept the charges? I'm stunned. Yes, I say. The operator goes off the line and Azim comes on. Hello, Haroon? Yes, it's me. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. They only let you make collect calls from here. Are you still in jail? It's a stupid question to ask, but sometimes stupid questions are comforting. You both know they're stupid, but you also both know you'll get through it. I don't like it much, he says. I wouldn't either. It was good to see you in court the other day. You and Julian. Please tell him I said so. I will. We were glad to come. Well, not glad. I know what you mean. It's okay. A lot of kids I thought were my friends won't take my call. They have me in a cell by myself. All I could talk to all day is adults, and you know how tiring that can be. I laugh. I know. You can never be yourself around adults. Haroon, he says, I would like to wish you and your family a happy Ramadan. Thank you, I say. The same to you. Are you able to observe? They're very careful about that, he says. They make sure that I have the right food and everything, but it's not the same as being at home. My parents are going to invite your parents to Ifar, I tell him. They're taking this pretty hard. I don't want to tell him, but I have to. I have your spot on the team. I know, he says, and I know you didn't turn me to the police to get it. I'm surprised he's heard, but rumors do have a way of getting around. You're better than me in geography, but you're not as good as I am on the mathematics questions, he says. I know, I say. I'm working on it, but I didn't have that same kind of mind as you. I'd get my sister to help me, but we're not getting along right now. It's Ramadan. It's the time to make peace. I'm working on it, I say. I could coach you, he offers, on the math, not your sister. I'm surprised that he's able to make a joke. That would be helpful, I say. Thank you. I have to go, he says. Can I call you again? Any time, I tell him. And then he's gone. Another toss-and-turn night. I finally get to sleep. Moments later, my father is knocking at my door, waking me up for a sohor. I try to embrace the day with a good spirit. It isn't easy. The news continues to be filled with threats. I take to buying newspapers on the way to school. There are photos of stranded passengers flooding airports and pictures of British Muslims arrested for alleged plots to blow things up in England. There are stories and maps showing the places in my city that are most vulnerable to terrorists. When I walk down the street, white people look at me in fear, even though I am dressed like they are dressed, even though my national anthem is still the same as theirs. We need to re-examine our immigration policy, news comment commenters say. Why are these people being allowed into our country? When it's pointed out that many of those arrested were actually born here and are citizens, the commentators and columnists say the Muslim community must take responsibility for extremism in their midst. The newspapers are also full of shattered buildings in Iraq and dead civilians in Afghanistan. If they stop killing us over there, we'll stop killing them here, says Hattie, whose locker is next to mine. Nobody's killing you, I say. Get your own paper. He flicks his fingers at the headlines and leaves me alone. Azim calls a couple more times. 
I tell no one about his calls. I try to get to the phone first when it rings, just in case it's him. We don't talk for long. He probably has limits on how long he can use the phone. He doesn't talk about what it's like in jail, and I don't ask him if he's guilty. We talk a bit about school, but mostly he gives me math tips. He says it is a distraction for him to work out shortcuts to give me. His shortcuts work. They don't work as well for me as they do for him because I simply don't have a math brain. But my time and success rate on those questions during drills improves. Miss Singh even pauses one day during the rapid-fire section to say, Well done, which almost never happens. Azim's parents come to Afar, but it's not a successful evening. They don't want to ruin our Ramadan with talk of their sorrow, and we don't know them well enough to talk about anything else. We should have invited Julian as well. Things are quieter at home, but not calmer. My parents will not reconcile themselves to my sister wearing full veil. They refuse to speak about it, as a concession to the spirit of Ramadan, but their silence is a loud, resentful one. And Zana, stubborn mule that she is, makes it even worse. She brings home a hijab for my mother and leaves it in the kitchen table with my mother's name on it. I hear my mother and father arguing about it, trying to keep their words quiet. In the morning, the hijab is gone, replaced by more silence. What's gotten into you? I asked Zana one afternoon after school. She is preparing to go to her friend's house for a fair. Mom is at the hospital. It looks like it will be just Dad and me tonight. You never cared about religion before. You told me once that the only thing you liked about the holidays was the new clothes. I don't expect you to understand, she says, moving to the front door and covering her face as she looks out for her ride. It's a known fact that women mature faster than men. That is a wonderfully Xana-like arrogant statement, but I'm not letting her get away with it. Then explain it to me simply, because kids are asking me about it in school, and I don't know what to tell them. That's partially a lie. No one has come right out and asked, not even Julian, but some have said things to me, as if they already know. Hattie told me, it's good that you're finally getting in control of your sister. Girls from Xana's basketball team glared at me in the hallway between classes, and I heard one of them say, he's the one making her wear that thing. It makes me feel guilty, even though both comments are laughable. Nobody can make Xana do something that she doesn't want to do. Not me, not the government, not even my mother. Have they met Xana? Tell me, I say again. Xana sighs and says, I'll try, but you won't get it. You float through life thinking everything and everyone is wonderful. That sounds like an insult, but I'm not certain. All around the world we're under attack. It's everywhere you look. Palestine, Iraq, Chechnya, Europe, North America. Muslims are not being attacked because of their religion, I say. They, we, they are being attacked, but because of land and oil. Zanny keeps talking as if I haven't even spoken. And when a group you belong to is under attack, if you don't show your loyalty, then you're siding with the attackers. What kind of logic is that? The world is not us and them. The world is many shades of all of us. I told you that you wouldn't understand. You're still a child, and you're not ready to hear me. If we were eight years younger, and this were not Ramadan, I could tackle her, and we could wrestle it out on the living room floor. She'd probably win, but at least I'd feel like it was a fair fight. What about the Islamic militia killing people in Darfur? I call after her as she leaves the house. We are not always on the side of the victims. She starts to walk away from me. You marched against the Taliban, I call after her. I watch Zana get into a car full of women who are veiled the way she is, including the woman who is driving. I want to yell at them. If this were Saudi Arabia, you wouldn't be allowed to drive. Luckily, my mouth stays shut, since that would have made about as much sense as the Gwen Stefani remark. My father will be home from work soon. Mom has left a chicken and rice casserole in the fridge. I put it in the oven and set the table. I'm looking forward to a quiet evening. So is my father, judging from the calm expression on his face when he arrives with both my mother and my sister gone, it will be an evening without argument. After we eat, he suggests going to evening prayers at the mosque. I'm surprised. It's not unheard of, but it's not usual, either, for us. I feel like being out in the world with my son, he says. We walk the few blocks to the mosque. I see Arab Muslims, Afghan Muslims, Somali Muslims, Muslims from India, and Muslims from Indonesia. Some are in traditional, national dress. Some, like my father and me, are in suits. As we rise and fall in prayer with the others, Miss Singh's question comes into my head. Am I praying to a God that created my ancestors, 
Or did my ancestors create the God that I am praying to? Does it even matter? The prayers, the celebration, the joining with others is beautiful. Does it matter where it all sprang from? To the two views always have to be at war. And then I put those thoughts away and I give myself over to the prayers. The October evening is soft and warm. We stop at an Afghan bakery for some of the honey snacks my father is so fond of, and which my mother tries to limit in favor of fruit. It's a holiday, he says with a smile. We do not rush on our way home. We do not talk. We just walk. My father, like Julian, also likes companionable silences. There is a police car waiting outside our house when we turn onto our block. Out comes Detective Moffat and another officer. Professor Bodwe, good evening, Haroon. My father shakes the police officer's hands and invites them in for tea and Afghan treats. It's probably best to have these eaten before my wife gets home anyways. I do not have a good feeling about this. I'm sure that they are not here to wish us a happy Ramadan. We're sorry to disturb you, Professor Badwi. We won't take much of your time. We just wanted to know if you were aware that your son has been accepting phone calls from one of the suspected terrorists that we have in our custody. I'm glad it's my father's steadiness that responds, and not my mother's argumentativeness. I know he's taken by surprise, but his voice betrays nothing, not even the slightest quiver. I assume you're speaking of the child you have locked up. He and my son know each other from school. It's natural that a youth seeks out youth. The cops look at my father silently for a long moment. I'm getting to know the way they use silence. I wonder if they come by it naturally or if they learn it from the police academy. My father doesn't squirm or look away or talk to fill up the space. He likes the silence. We have to use all the tools we can to fight this terrible threat, Detective Moffat says. Every new tool the law has to offer, my father adds. If you can't keep a closer watch on your son, we'll have to. Since you know that he's been receiving the boys' phone calls, you probably also know the content of the calls. Prisoners have no expectations of privacy, except when they consult your lawyers. Your son is not a lawyer. My son is also not in prison, but leaving aside his right to privacy for a moment, I would bet you this box of Afghan delicacies that they have talked about no more than school and other usual things that boys have in common. Am I right? He holds out the box of sweets. Detective Moffat tries his silence trick again, but not for long. He can see it doesn't work on my father. You might want to advise your son not to accept any more calls. Thank you for your kind advice, father says. I hope you both enjoy the rest of this beautiful evening. The officers get back in their car and drive away. I stand beside my father by our front door until the police car has gone down the street and we can't hear or see it anymore. Then my father says, your grandparents left Afghanistan so that we would not be bothered by war or chaos or hatred or suspicion so we could live our lives without fear or torture or police brutality or the kind of craziness that plagues most of the people on this sad planet. Our parents worked hard, and we have worked hard, to give you and your sister a decent life, an ideal life, and both of you, each in your own way, have brought the world of craziness right into our house. He unlocks the front door and goes inside. I stay on the porch, standing alone, and looking out at the night.